Many of the tropes found in classic tales, as well as in modern stories, have been around for millennia. And one that I find quite inspiring is that of the hero's journey. And so we'll be looking at how Jacob's life gives us a wonderful study of this theme. <music> Greetings and welcome to Reading Between the Lines. The story of Jacob begins with his birth in chapter 25 of Genesis and goes all the way until the end in chapter 50 with his death. Which means, with a few exceptions, Jacob's story takes up about half of the book of Genesis. Also, Jacob holds a special place in my heart. For my wife's name is Rebecca, and our oldest son is named Jacob. And he really does have the sarcasm, wit, and the trickster traits to rival his biblical counterpart. In his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell summarizes the narrative pattern of this monomyth as follows. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered, and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. The journey, of course, is not always linear and can be circular in part or in whole. And this can also be seen in the various archetypes that are found within the story. And in Genesis, we can see these archetypes as the individuals that Jacob encounters, but also he may play that part in someone else's story. For remember that each person has their own hero's journey. Even each of us have been embarking or are in some place in our own hero's story, which is the great part about this monomyth. We can see ourselves and we can see the various characters that we encounter throughout our lives, even the supernatural ones. So with this in mind, we'll specifically be looking at Jacob's life and how his story fits into the hero's journey. And after that, we'll come back around and see how this can be applied to our individual lives. But before jumping into the journey itself, let's look at the characters that we'll meet along the way. Traditionally, there are eight archetypes. And so we'll go through these and see how, who they are and how they relate to Jacob himself. First comes the hero. And of course, Jacob will be the hero of our story. The next character is the mentor. The mentor in these tales often has supernatural abilities. Think Obi-Wan Kenobi or Glinda from The Wizard of Oz, or even Athena, the goddess of wisdom. For Jacob, his mentor seems to be God himself. As we will see, this power is manifested through various elements as the story unfolds. And then we come to the ally. The ally is sometimes even more interesting than the hero. He or she is the best friend, the one the hero depends upon and leans on. They keep the hero focused, but also bring levity and humor to the adventure. The most well-known might be Sam from Lord of the Rings, but Han Solo and Ron Weasley also come to mind. For Jacob, his ally changes throughout his story. His mother, Rebecca, may take this role in the beginning, but this is really before his true journey begins. Then his wife, Rachel, becomes his soulmate and his trusted companion. Later, he places his love and strength into his son, Joseph, who remains his ally even when he can no longer trust his other sons. The herald is another integral part of the story. This is the one who sets the hero off on their journey. This may be a character like R2-D2, or even an event or a letter, such as the invitation to the ball for Cinderella. For Jacob, his twin brother Esau is his herald. His very existence is a challenge for Jacob, but also a challenge to his place in the promise. Jacob's relationship and rivalry with Esau sets into motion a series of events that forces Jacob to begin his journey away from home. Like the ally, the trickster also brings humor to the story, but also presents a different perspective and forces the hero to look at the world differently. Falling victim to tricks can cause the hero to find new solutions and grow. Yoda is a bit of a trickster before becoming the mentor figure. And of course, Loki is a classic example. However, sometimes the trickster is also the hero, such as Peter Pan or Captain Jack Sparrow. Jacob himself also takes on the role of trickster in his own story. Conversely, Laban, his father-in-law, can also be seen as a trickster, who challenges Jacob and forces him to grow, although he is not his true adversary. Oftentimes, there is a shapeshifter character as well, which is sometimes the same person as the trickster. The difference is that the shapeshifter changes between ally and antagonist. You never quite know their motives or whether they will turn on or help the hero. Dr. Elsa Schneider in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is a good example of a shapeshifter, or Golem from Lord of the Rings. In our story of Jacob, Esau may fulfill this rule as he seems to be Jacob's enemy and even his cause for exile. However, later Esau proves himself to be Jacob's ally, even though Jacob never fully trusts him. Next, we have the guardian. 
The Guardian typically appears at a crucial threshold for our hero and tries to get him or her to abandon the quest. They can be a character or a physical barrier or test. The doorknob in Alice in Wonderland or the royal ball in Labyrinth are examples of guardians. In our story, the angel with whom Jacob wrestles acts as a guardian, attempting to prevent him from crossing the river to return home. And what hero's journey would be complete without the shadow? This is your typical villain, whether it be the Wicked Witch of the West or Darth Vader. And like Vader, the shadow may indeed act as a mirror or shadow of the hero, indicating what they may become if they choose the dark path. Of course, Jacob may be his own shadow and must overcome his deceitful side in order to become the man that God has called him to be. Laban can also be seen as his shadow too, as we see the trickery in him that mirrors that of Jacob earlier in our story. Now that we know who some of the characters that we'll be meeting along the journey are, let us look at the story itself. And there are various stages that we will find along the story. And various movies or fictional novels that we've seen over the years will take some stages and leave out others, or they will have the full gambit of everything that a hero may encounter. So here's one simplified version of the hero's journey. As we see in this diagram, we have the call to adventure, the meeting a mentor, crossing the threshold, trials and failure, growth and possibly learning new skills, death and rebirth, a revelation, the true changes of the hero, time of atonement, and then our hero receives a gift or boon. And finally, the hero returns changed. According to Campbell, there are three acts in our story, and they don't always have to be followed in order, and some may be revisited. Because just like in real life, sometimes lessons have to be repeated over and over again until we finally learn the lesson. These three acts are departure, initiation, and return. And Campbell's list contains many stages in each act. As we look at Jacob's life, we can see how he fits into these stages. In many ways, Jacob seems to have two journeys in which he continues to learn new lessons. Many of us can relate, especially as we get older and begin to reflect on our lives. And if you're unfamiliar with any of the stories of Jacob, please feel free to check out any of the previous videos. I put their links in the description, as well as a new playlist in which I've only included the stories that pertain specifically to Jacob and his story. But now let's look at the stages in the story of his life. The first act is departure. And the first stage would be the call to adventure. For Jacob, this is when he tricks his father and is sent away due to his brother's anger. After this is the refusal of the call. Jacob did not want a journey. He just wanted to be blessed and remain at home. And we are told that he liked to stay amongst the tents. Then there is the supernatural aid. For Jacob, I believe this is the stairway to heaven dream that he has in Bethel. Here we find out that God will be his mentor and guide. Then we have the crossing of the first threshold. Jacob makes a conscious decision to enter into the quest. He rises on the next day and vows to make the journey. And then there is the belly of the whale. This is the time spent laboring in Haran for his father-in-law Laban. The second act is that of initiation. And I believe there are actually two rounds of this for Jacob because he doesn't quite learn his lesson the first time around. And he has to go through an entire new set of trials before he really realizes who God is calling him to be. This begins with the road of trials. And for Jacob, this is when he's caring for flocks, his double marriage to the sisters, and the marital problems that stem from this, and also how he relies on God and his own wit during this time. The trial begins a second time with his sons after his first return. The next stage Campbell calls meeting with the goddess. And this can be seen as Rachel, or could occur much later as this is a metaphor for being at peace, giving love and receiving love. This is often seen as the culmination of the final test to win the boon of love. Jacob seems to have two journeys, so we see this again when Jacob settles in Canaan with his 12 sons. And also perhaps at the very end when he settles in Egypt also with his children. Another stage is the encountering a woman or man as temptress. Again, a metaphor for temptation, often to abandon the quest. This can also refer to the guardian that we saw in the archetypes. His singular love and devotion for Joseph may represent this temptation for Jacob. The promise given to him was meant for all of his sons, and not just a few. Then there is the atonement with the father. In this story, Esau may take the place of the father that he must reconcile with, knowing that in deceiving his father Isaac, he brought the wrath of his brother upon him. He must confront and be reconciled with him in order to progress his journey. Apotheosis. 
This is the realization and most likely can be seen in Jacob wrestling with the angel or God himself, which allows him to gain new knowledge about himself and the divine. We're also told that he receives a new name at this time, and this signals a change. Finally, we have the ultimate boon. This is the achievement of the goal. Again, this seems to occur in stages for Jacob because as he realizes, Yahweh was present with him the entire time. The return signals really the end of the journey, or at least this cycle of the journey, because like Jacob, it is possible that we can go through this journey more than once, because as we grow, we continue to learn new things and to change the relationship that we have, both with the other characters in the story and also with the divine power. This often begins with a refusal to return, another reoccurring theme that prevents him from coming home, his fear of his brother and the grief over Joseph. Part of the traditional refusal is to hang on to the boon and not return to share it with others. Then there is the magic flight. And this occurs twice again for Jacob, once in returning to confront Esau and later to go to Egypt to be reunited with Joseph. Next is the rescue from without. Here it is God working through not only Joseph, but also through his brothers who act as intermediaries that rescue Jacob from his grief and bring him to Egypt. And we have the crossing of the threshold, or in this time, crossing the return threshold. Jacob finally takes on his role as the father, claiming the name given to him, Israel. Now he is able to bless all of his sons and pass on the boon, which is a relationship with God, and ultimately a share in the promise given to him and to his father and grandfather before him. The next stage is what is called the master of two worlds. And these worlds often refer to the material and the spiritual. So now that he has done so, Jacob can peacefully join his ancestors, knowing that his journey is complete. And finally, there is the freedom to live. Jacob's journey encompassed his entire life, but it was always in order to play his part in the plan and promise of God. His name lives on in his family, who now have the freedom to live as the sons and daughters of Israel. Now that we have journeyed with Jacob through his journey, we might ask ourselves, where am I on this hero's journey? Or what stage am I in right now? Or maybe how can I set off on this journey that has been set before me? If we relook at the descriptions of the hero's journey, we might realize two things. There are supernatural elements in play and the hero returns with something special to share with others. The supernatural in stories might be the force or magic or superpowers or divine beings, but there is something that the hero interacts with and often learns some aspect of it then he or she can use that power to help others or share that knowledge for good. I would guess that many of those watching this channel have faith in the divine or some belief or even questions about God. This is the supernatural element of your journey. And this is what changes the ordinary life into the hero's quest. And I believe in that moment in which we find some sort of understanding or realization of the divine is what really transforms your life. I took some time to look at the various archetypes at the beginning because I believe they are so important in our lives. The God of the Bible is one of relationship, and we have been given the opportunity for various relationships throughout our lives. We might highlight a few of these characters as they relate to our lives. The ally is such an important person. This is your best friend or soulmate. This is the one who keeps you going, who encourages you, who holds your hair when you're drunk or throwing up. Seriously. The shadows of our own journeys are not going to be fantastic beasts, but the everyday temptations and hurdles of life. We all need a Sam by our side. Mine is my wife, who has allowed me to become the best version of myself. She doesn't let me give up. She remains by my side. These are the kinds of people that are so important in our lives. Of course, there is also the mentor, who is different than the ally. This is someone who has a particular wisdom, knowledge, or experience that we seek whether we realize it or not. The mentor helps us to encounter the divine. He might be a priest or a pastor, a rabbi or an imam. She might be your mother or grandmother, or they might be a coworker or a leader that inspires you. These are the kinds of people that inspire us with wisdom, with some sort of sense of the divine and with advice that really changes us as to who we are and gives us new insight. And if you don't have a mentor or you can't identify one, it's never too late to seek one out. We might find these teachers in literature and ancient stories, but it's also important to have someone with whom we can talk and explore the new ideas and beliefs with that we may encounter. 
It is also necessary to be aware of the guardians and shadows that we meet on our journey. Who or what tries to impede my progress? They could be people, bad influences, those who lead us astray. They may be also elements of ourselves that we are afraid to let go of. They may be the easy path that seems so much more appealing than the course of action that we know to be right. The guardians, however, are not to be avoided, but are there for us to overcome. Even in the gospel accounts of Jesus, he had to pass the three challenges of the devil who tried to stop him from his ministry, his mission. C.S. Lewis writes, A silly idea is current, that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. And now with an awareness of who might be accompanying us on our journey, let's take a look once again at the three acts and see how you might step into your journey. The call to adventure can begin, continue, or restart at any moment in your life. It is a new job opportunity, a move across the country or world, a marriage, the birth of a child, an encounter with Christ. Do you pause? Do you refuse? Do you take time to discern? Let's say you embark and find yourself in the belly of the whale. Who is in there with you? What can you learn? When you accept this quest, you will encounter many challenges, but also many rewards. But in order to succeed, you will need to call on a power greater than yourself. Who can teach you about this power? Then there's the time of initiation. These are also moments of transition, conflict, and struggles in life. You learn, you fail, you get back up. You face challenges, you fail, you seek more wisdom. You rely on your allies, your mentors, even your shapeshifters. You encounter God and find strength. Yet, to your surprise, more challenges await and you may continue to fail. You confront past sins and present temptations. You grow in faith and resilience. You find moments of conviction and peace. You realize that you now possess experience and knowledge wisdom, and faith. What will you do with these newfound gifts? Do you share them with others? Do you fight against injustice and ignorance? Do you become the mentor to others who are just starting out on their journeys? This is the return. This is the time not to retire, but to pass on what you have learned. Not just your successes, but also your failures. While you have a new freedom at the trail's end, you realize that the journey is never truly finished. Thank you so much for joining me, and hopefully this has given you some food for thought, and perhaps a reason to relook at your own faith journey from a new perspective. Please feel free to write down any of your thoughts or experiences of your hero's journey in the comments below. And once again, thank you, God bless, and continue reading between the lines.